Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. Dan is away on military leave right now, so we're going to bring back some of our previous shows that didn't make it to the podcast. We hope that you enjoy them. As always, we welcome your feedback. If you'd like a written transcript of the show, please email me at Karen, K-A-R-E-N, dot Cox, C-O-X, at mail, M-A-I-L, dot W-V-U, dot E-D-U, or call 304-234-3673. Thanks again for listening. So I just wanted to let you know that for those of you who are producing um, processed foods for human consumption, that especially for you small businesses, uh, making a million dollars or less, that's what you would be for a very small business. If you are averaging less than $1 million per year in both annual sales plus uh, the market value of the human food that's manufactured, processed, packed, or held without sale, um, you need to be recording your uh, financial records and keeping them, and you need to submit to the FDA a uh, application for attestation, basically saying that you are exempt from the Preventative Controls Act. And this act is to update the food safety management for the processing of human foods. So if you are a small farm who is processing lettuce to sell at the farmer's market, you are automatically exempt because most of your sales are going direct to the consumer. But if you are process slicing lettuce to sell to a school, for instance, then you are selling to an institution who is then pr- distributing your food to someone else. If that is your situation or a similar situation, then you really do need to contact the FDA for for the attestation of the Preventive Controls Act. If you have questions about what that means, I welcome you to give me a call. And my phone number is 304-234-3673. That's 304-234-3673. Now, this is important for you who process foods uh, for human consumption that you need to know because if you do not submit your application for attestation for exemption for the Preventative Controls Act, then you automatically are under the Preventive Controls Act. And there are some regulations and some uh, extra paperwork that you need to do that you wouldn't need to do otherwise. Um, For the larger producers, they are automatically under this. But if you have questions about what this means, please feel free to call me or you can send me an email at Karen, K-A-R-E-N dot Cox, C-O-X at mail, M-A-I-L dot W-V-U dot E-D-U. That's Karen dot Cox at mail dot W-V-U dot E-D-U. And uh, this is really important for you small pe- small producers out there. Uh, it does change some of the things that we're looking at uh, as far as trying to make sure that allergens and pathogens are properly notified to the consumer and protected from uh, the consumers protected from those things. And basically, it is trying to help you develop a uh, hazard analysis, find out where the dangers are in your production, where pathogens could be introduced, how you can control those pathogens. And also the cross contact issues with allergens. Allergens are a growing issue with our population. Um, There are more and more very severe allergies where there can be anaphylactic shock, uh, which could result in death or hospitalization. It's a very serious issue. And so if you are producing foods for human consumption, you are required by law, regardless of your size, to make sure that you label the top eight allergens. Um, Those allergens would include things like eggs, milk, soy, wheat, uh, tree nuts, peanuts, 
and I'm blanking on the next couple. Um, but there are, there's a, like the big eight allergens. And so it's really important that you are labeling any allergens that are in your foods um, that are being produced for production for uh, human consumption, uh, regardless of whether or not you're selling it to an institution or direct to a consumer. Um, so for those of you who are bakers or cookie makers, uh, make sure that you are labeling all of the allergens on your products. Um, this can usually be helped out by putting all your ingredients on there and you do need to list all of your ingredients and uh, allergens need to be listed separately as in hey there's a potential allergen here I want to draw your attention to it now so for those of you who are growing things whether they be uh, cattle hay or vegetables um, excess moisture is really causing some issues out here we're having a lot of slides um, and slips and also we're noticing that our plants aren't growing as well as maybe they should uh, the problem is is that excess moisture disturbs the oxygen balance in the root zone it's basically drowning your roots and it actually reduces the amount of water that the plant can take up uh, when it doesn't have available oxygen in the soil it also happens when the air is really humid, the plants are going to close their stomates, which are the small openings on their leaves, which allow transpiration to occur, basically stopping the flow of the water that comes from the roots up into the leaves. When that flow of water is reduced, it also reduces the plant's intake of minerals and nutrients. So basically what you're going to th see is problems with those non-mobile nutrients like calcium causing problems in the plant itself. So for instance, blossom end rot is a very common result of this lost nutrient flow. So when there's too much water, we actually see a lot more blossom end rot because you're, the plants aren't taking up enough calcium. Um, typically, blossom and end rot is localized damage, and then, but the problem is, is that secondary organisms are going to come in and they're going to cause your entire fruit to rot. A lot of times, your tomatoes are the ones that are first going to first going to show the problems. Uh, one of the uh, Symptoms you can see on your tomato plants if they are experiencing too much water would be the curling of the leaves. So if you're noticing that your tomato leaves are really curling, it could be a calcium deficiency caused by too much water in the soil. Um, so this is a big problem because it's really hard to, after the fact, reduce the amount of water in the soil. Uh, Raising your beds up can be helpful. Piling your soil up against, because tomatoes are really good advantageous rooters. So if you have some tomatoes that are having some problems, perhaps mounding soil up along the main stem can help lift those. It'll grow new roots into that new soil. And it could potentially uh, lift your roots up high enough out of the soil so that they can develop a more oxygen rich environment around them and thus be able to process those nutrients again. Um, also, you're going to see a nitrogen deficiency associated with this and uh, maybe yellowing and dying of those lower leaves, uh, chlorosis or yellowing inside the vein area uh, in, or in between the vein areas in the older leaves. Um, that is going to be less likely in soils with high nitrogen content. So you could potentially side dress with half the recommended nitrogen application uh, four to six weeks after planting, uh, maybe when your corn is 12 to 20 inches tall, or if you see signs of nitrogen deficiency, side, de side dress now with a urea-based fertilizer. Uh, make sure that uh, you aren't drowning your plants though. So number one is try to reduce the water in the, uh, that is up against the roots of the soil by ditching Digging some ditches in between the garden rows is very helpful, but you do need to be careful that you're not disturbing the roots of those plants and causing them additional stress. Also, uh, it's going to reduce your soil temperature, which could reduce your um, fruiting. Uh, your plants that have low soil temperatures typically have a shallower rooting system, and also this goes aside with 
more water in the soil, you're going to reduce, raise that soil level. So those roots are going to try to go up above where the water table is in the soil. And shallow root systems are, of course, more sensitive to changes in water. And so they're less efficient in obtaining those nutrients from the soil. You could get your plants like corn plants. Uh, we'll, you'll have a lot more root lodging should we have some high winds. And it's not going to be a total loss as long as the stem doesn't break. It does stress the plant and makes it more prone to some diseases and, of course, makes it more difficult to harvest. So really we're looking at some root crop uh, when... Sorry, let me back up here. You're looking at your root crops. Uh, other problems you're going to have with root crops could be a splitting problem. Um, whenever you have drastic changes in water levels where it doesn't rain for a week and then it doesn't stop raining for a week, um, your root crops will split. Now, this is only cosmetic, but some people don't want to buy that ugly fruit and that could cause a problem or that ugly root, I should say. Some crops could split from too much water, opening up them for disease. Uh, tomatoes uh, and uh, fruits like cherries are, have a big problem with splitting. Splitting with cherries and plums could also be a boron deficiency, causing them to, the skin to not be as elastic as it should be. So if you do have splitting regularly, again, look at making sure you're getting a soil test. If you're growing fruits, you also want to do a tissue test where you're going to pull off a couple leaves along the stem of the plant. And actually, this is a good time to do a tissue test for your fruiting plants, especially fruit trees. Make sure that they have the micronutrients. Just because the nutrients are in the soil doesn't really mean that the plant is taking them up appropriately. So you need to make sure that those plants have the nutrients that they need in the leaves themselves. And if they don't, maybe you could look into how you can adjust the soil to a better aid that intake. So if you know that micronutrients in the soil and it's not in the plant, it could be that there is a nutrient where there's too much of it. Say, for instance, magnesium could block the uptake of boron. So you want to make sure that you're balancing all of the soil nutrients. Having a really high level of nutrient isn't always a good thing. Um, phosphorus and potassium can block uptake, or potassium can block uptake of magnesium. Magnesium can block uptake of boron. You have all of these uh, ripple effects that happen through the soil. So you do want to make sure that the, tr the tree or the plant is getting the proper nutrients actually into the plant. And if it's not, then you need to look into, okay, well, what's blocking the uptake of this particular nutrient? Is there too much of another nutrient in the soil is the ph wrong or is there simply just too much water in the soil and the plant's not able to pull it out so another thing you want to think about is cabbages cabbages are really good at absorbing water and they can decay more quickly uh, once they're harvested and of course, when you have lots of these cool, wet weather days, you are going to have more diseases. So we're going to have see a lot more black rot on our grapes this year. We're going to see septoria leaf spot on our tomatoes. And we're definitely already seeing powdery mildew powdery mildew on our cucurbits. So you want to make sure that you are working through a preventative management system with those particular diseases. Keep your um, soil covered underneath your tomatoes and your cucurbits to make sure that the soil isn't splashing up on the leaves. That is the main vector for disease transmission is when the soil splashes up on the leaves. Tomatoes and cucumbers, you can prune them up a little bit, put your cucumbers up on a trellising system, get them up off of the ground. Your other smaller squashes, you can do that with as well. Uh, once you get to your bigger squashes, like your big pumpkins, uh, they don't, don't do so well on a trellising system simply because when they get heavy, they'll just break off the stem. But your smaller ones do really well on trellising systems. So try to look into how you can get those plants up off of the ground where you can increase the airflow around them. Um, and so you may want to be removing more leaves than you would in a dry year just to keep that airflow going and help reduce the disease issues that are associated with poor airflow and lots of water. A final note on the wet foods issue, uh, you want to make sure that if you do have flooding that comes into your garden, and we're not talking about uh, that flash flood off of the hillside, I'm talking about if the creek comes up out of the creek bed and sits in your garden, that is where you're going to have a lot of contaminants, um, raw sewage, petroleum products. These are things that do not you do not want to touch the edible portion of your crop. So if those floodwaters 
touch the edible portion of your crop. Maybe you could even have splashed up onto the edible portion of your crop. That food is considered adulterated and thus should not enter the human food chain. All right, it will need to be discarded. And this also includes hay and grains. You don't want to feed those to your animals because you don't know the type of pathogens that could be in there. Also, mycotoxins could be growing due to mold spores. So you want to make sure that if that water has been or if those foods have been flooded, uh, be they for animal or human consumption, you really don't want to keep them. You do want to destroy them. All right, so some tips you can use to reduce damage from too much rain. Um, Try digging furrows between the rows. Uh, That could help with drainage and also um, lift the root systems up out of the ground a little bit more. Um, Also, you want to look around about mulching. Um, Mulching can help regulate moisture levels, uh, but you do want to keep your mulch from touching the stem of the main plant. You also want to avoid walking in the mud. Put boards down to walk on uh, whenever you go out to harvest. That's going to reduce the compaction that happens. I mean, just your foot can cause soil compaction. And if it is a produce production area, you don't want that compaction because that's going to cause... Again, that ripple effect of soil issues where you are uh, not having as many pores that can hold that water and you're going to have less pore space for oxygen as well. So try just putting boards down when you're walking out in the harvest area uh, if the soil is wet. And also, of course, you know, tractors are huge issues when it comes to wet soils and compaction. Uh, And just keep in mind, you know, if it's been raining every day for a week, sometimes you can't avoid getting out into the field. But if you think it's going to be dry for a day or two, that's when you really want to try to get your uh, tractor work done on those drier days. You know, ideally, we'd like to say don't go out in the field for three days after it's rained. Um, But we all know that we don't live in an ideal world, so just try to do your best. Um, also, you want to make sure that when you're taking foliage, excess foliage off of your plants, that you're not going to remove too many from near where the fruits are, because then you could have issues with sun scald when the sun does decide to grace our, grace us again with its presence. Also, once you start to see diseases coming up on the plants, you do want to remove those disease materials, discard or burn them, and of course, do not compost any disease materials because that's just going to uh, continue that disease rotation system. You want to make sure you're fertilizing your nitrogen deficient plants with a high nitrogen fertilizer to replace what's lost from the leaching and the mineralization that occurs when soils are waterlogged. Also, uh, in the fall, you want to think about aerating your lawn every fall, and that's going to reduce compaction and help drainage in your lawn system. If you aren't in in a place where you can uh, or where you need to mow your lawn, then, of course, you don't need to worry about that. But if you have an area where you're continually running a lawn mower over it, uh, you are slowly compacting that soil down each time you mow, especially if you're mowing after it rains. And uh, lawn mowing goes the same as tractors. If you can wait three days before you go out and get that the, the grass mown, um, you definitely want to try to do that. And if you see your leaves becoming discolored, uh, do look into and consider a tissue test. Um, and if you are growing fruit trees, you also want to make sure you're doing a tissue test every year just to make sure that those fruits aren't going to grow beautifully all year. And then when you go to harvest them, they can have things like brown rot or dry pockets, the skin could could crack open. Um, These are all things that can be associated with a really wet year. And also, if you think you have a disease, uh, make sure that you are sending us pictures so that we can confirm your di- the diagnosis for you. Uh, if we can't do it through a picture, then you can send us a sample. Uh, a lot of times we can do it if you can get a really good picture. Now, the trick with getting a good picture is that you really need to... Make sure that your camera isn't like if you're using your phone to take a picture, don't zoom it all the way in on the phone because that is going to reduce the quality of the picture. So it may look bigger on your screen, but it's going to have a poorer resolution. It's much better if we can zoom in uh, using the computer if it is just taken at the regular scale with your camera phone. 
So don't zoom in with a, with a phone. Just try to get as close as you can with it still being in focus. Take multiple pictures from the top of the leaf, the bottom of the leaf, where the leaf touches the plant, where the leaves are on the plant. Take the whole plant picture. All of those things are triggers and clues that could tell us what's going on with the plant. Same goes for trees. If you have a tree problem, you're starting to see decline on a tree. We can't just look at a leaf of the tree and say, okay, this is what's wrong with your tree. We need to see the whole tree, the branch of the tree that's having the problem, the base of the tree, where it touches the soil. That soil line really is a crucial part for any plant because that is the main conductive activity area for the plant. It's where the leaves send the nutrients to the roots. It's where the roots send the minerals back up to the leaves. It is a really crucial part. So if that area is damaged in any way, say from a weed whacker or from an insect that's been burrowing under the soil or or a rodent that's burrowing, uh, that area is your trigger point. That is the area that you need to address before anything else will work. So when you're sending pictures of plants or trees, make sure that you're getting that soil line where the tree or the plant actually goes from above the soil to below the soil. Please, we do welcome you to send us pictures and uh, we'd be happy to help you try to determine what's going on with your plants. However, we do ask that you are patient. There's only one of me. Dan is gone for a while. And uh, while our master gardeners are doing their best, uh, sometimes it takes us a little while to get back to you. And on that note, if you're interested in becoming a master gardener, please make sure you let us know. You get 40 hours of very intensive training to help you figure out how to do these diagnoses yourself, how to better plant things to prevent problems from happening and also gives you the opportunity to work with other uh, experienced individuals to help you improve your abilities and uh, it's a great cohort they're all really great people and fun to work with lots of great activities that they do so if you're interested in becoming a master gardener please give a call to your local extension office and uh, they can help you out with that even if it's not mine All right, so another thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was hay. A lot of problems with hay when you are trying to harvest hay uh, and it rains uh, can cause a real, real issue. And so one of the things you want to consider if it has rained on your hay, you want to make sure, well, (laughs) if you've cut your hay and haven't gotten it baled, If it rains a really heavy rain just after you cut, it's really not going to have that much of an impact. But if you harvest your hay or if it rains when your hay is almost dry, um, you can lose up to 3% of your protein content, uh, which is really going to reduce its ability to help feed your animals later in the year when you need it. So if you are baling hay that has been rained on after it was almost dry, you really really, really want to do a forage test on that hay because if it lost a lot of its leaf matter in that rain, then you are going to be maybe feeding your animals straw and not hay. It's not going to have the nutrient ability uh, or nutrients that your animals need. So make sure you do a forage test. They're not hard. They're not incredibly expensive. Um, The best time to do a forage test is about a week before you feed. However, if you are going to remember to do it now and you're probably going to forget later in the year then go ahead and do it now Um, it's better to do a forage test early than to not do one at all so make sure that you are keeping this uh, early cut hay this first cut hay um, if especially if it got rained on separate from your second cut and your third cut if you can get one make sure that you are protecting it from additional rainfall And if you can get it bailed, bail it tightly. It's really important to shed water for the hay to be baled tightly. So if you have some loose, wonky looking bales that aren't quite well, we'll just say they're they're not pretty. (laughs) And and we all we've all seen them out there. It's make sure that those are the ones that are fed out early, gotten rid of early or covered in some way because that loose hay isn't going to store as well as a tightly wrapped bale. You know, if you have a good tight wrap on your bale, you're not only going to have fewer bales overall because you're going to have more hay per bale, um, but also you can take those really tight wrap bales and you can put them out in your winter feed paddock 
and that way you can keep your animals rotated and when the soil is uh, and you're going to take them out when the soil is dry and then when the soil gets soggy again and this is of course assuming that the soil does eventually get dry <laughs> you want to make sure that um, you're putting them out when the soil is dry and you can put them out in different paddock areas so that way your animals aren't completely destroying uh, your winter feed area if you don't have it paved or designated as a winter feed area rotating animals through different paddocks throughout the winter is really good for reducing compaction caused by their their hooves when the soil is moist other problems rain can do it that have with hay is um well it can cause moldy hay and that is of course an opportunity for mycotoxins to develop and could make your animal sick also uh fires when baling is done with too much moisture you're going to end up with the potentiality of a haystack fire and you have to note that if the bales are stacked outside and they're not on a good drainage surface so if you don't have a surface for the bale to drain they're just sitting right on the soil uh, the, all this moisture that's in the ground right now can actually soak up into the bottom of your bales the ones that are on the ground level and again those can begin to heat and catch fire from internal combustion simply by soaking up all of this moisture out of the ground so if you don't have a place to store your hay inside you either want to wrap your bales or you want to put them on a high surface uh, either at the top of the hill or you want to store them on a gravel drainage pad that way you don't have that loss in your bottom bales of hay and also you have to know that you you can lose nutrients um, as hay heats so uh, let's see losses of over three percent protein and ten percent of your TDN have been documented um, in thus increasing your non-digestible fiber um, so in also vitamin A is lost um, when your hay stays out in those windrows before you can get it bailed. Um, so there is a serious loss of nutrients when you are just waiting for the rain to stop um, after that hay has been cut. The longer it's out in those fields, um, the worse the nutrient loss is going to be. So you can do a forage test before you even get it bailed, um, just going down the windrows and pulling out some samples as you go, making sure that you're being uh, random in your selection and that it's not just all in the very center of the wind row you're getting some from the edges of the wind row uh, keep the variety increased and you can test that before it's bailed uh, but it will take time for you to get that test back so odds are you're going to have it bailed by the time that you get your test results anyway uh, let's see here you can also lose five percent per inch of rain that occurs while the hay is in the windrow so also keep that in mind you'll have to rake it more to get it to dry and if it looks like just a pile of brown sticks um, it may not even be worth your time to continue to rake and try to bale that hay unless you have a need for straw in your rotational system now hay that has not good just to get back to the heating process if it's gotten hot but it hasn't caught fire you can still have a heat damaged protein and it'll still show up as crude protein on a lab test, but your animals cannot digest heat damaged protein. The, it actually changes the um, structure of the protein and um, you would have to ask the lab to check for ADIN or ADI protein. That's acid detergent insoluble nitrogen or protein. And the amount of damage is related to how soon after wind rowing the rain hits. Like I said earlier, uh, if it's nearly dry, you're going to have a lot more damage than if it's right after. Um, and a light rain uh, soon after wind rowing, uh, well, it's going to cause delay in your baling with a little nutrient loss. A rain on hay that it's nearly dry is going to cause leaf shatter. Um, you're going to lose, a, especially with your legumes. Uh, legume leaves are very fragile when they dry and they're going to dry faster than the grasses. So you're going to have a lot of your you're going to lose pretty much all of your leg legumes um, for a rain that hits your nearly dry hay let's see also the heavier the rain uh, the more nutrients you're going to lose so do try your best um, unfortunately mother nature doesn't always cooperate with us so if you get one lesson out of today it is if you're growing vegetables get a tissue test done and or fruits get a tissue test done and if you're growing hay get a forage test done.
wet soils cause havoc for us when we go to harvest and also to feed out our hay. Uh, And with that, COVID-19 vaccination protects you and those around you. When communities are vaccinated, fewer people get sick. Community immunity begins with each one of us. Visit vaccinate.wv.gov to learn more about COVID-19 vaccination. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.